This session is going to be a briefing on our new fireground survival program, and I'm calling it a briefing because what we're going to do is give you as much information as we possibly can about the program, but I want to encourage you, please, ask questions. Uh, in addition to myself and uh, Derek Alconas, several of our instructors are in the room and also some of my staff who are responsible for coordinating this effort. So if there's any questions you have, don't leave without getting those answered uh, while we're here today. My name is Jim Brinkley, and I'm the Director of Health and Safety for the IFF. Uh, prior to coming to the IFF, I was a uh, battalion chief for Prince George's County, Maryland Fire Department. I served 21 years there. I was also the union president for two uh, cycles and served on the executive board for about 14 years. And uh, early in my career, I want to say in the, in the first five or seven years or so, uh, we began to develop our own fire ground survival program. And, I know when we completed that, we really thought we had the, uh, the best program out there. And it wasn't until I got to the IFF and began working with some of the, the talented members we have throughout North America that I discovered there, there are a, a vast array of resources available and some great information available. And we were able to put together what we believe is the most comprehensive uh, firefighter survival and skills program uh, that's out there today. As I said, I am the Director of Health and Safety. I work directly for Rich Duffy, the Assistant to the General President for Occupational Health, Safety, and Medicine, and he's the one that really gives us our direction uh, and oversees our entire staff. With me today is Derek Alconis from Los, Los Angeles County, Local 1014. He's a battalion chief with that department. Uh, Derek has worked with the IFF for a number of years, uh, going way back to the development of the Wellness Fitness Initiative some 13 years ago. Uh, the development of our candidate physical abilities test and also our peer fitness training curriculum and Derek was the lead investigator for this program and responsible for putting together all the content for uh, the IFF and if you want more detailed information on either one of our bios you can find that in your abstract books which you received in your registration bags. I'm going to go over some informational slides here in the beginning then I'm going to turn it over to Derek. If you look at the trends of firefighter deaths over the years. We're looking here from 1977 to 2009. You can see it's pretty much consistent. If you average that out, like we always say, it's probably about 100 firefighter line of duty deaths per year. Now, why is that the case with the number of fires that are declining? There's got to be something we're doing wrong or something else we could be doing to help improve these statistics in our favor. You look at how these deaths are spread out in this graphic here. Still, we always believe that it's cardiac deaths. That's what you hear a lot now, that they're cardiac related. Almost half of them are. And you know what? They are. There's still 43% in this uh, statistic from 2009. But look at that bottom left, the trauma section. That's still a good percentage of deaths that are occurring on the fire ground during fire suppression operations. That's not cardiac related. So how can we focus on that? How can we reduce those deaths? We've had the Wellness Fitness Initiative for some 13 years, candidate physical ability tests, peer fitness training. We're addressing the medical side of it. We're looking at the presumption laws. We're looking at the respiratory protection. But what are we doing about those traumatic deaths that occur on the fire ground? You can see here from the type of duty, uh, again, 33% operating on the fire ground. And that's something that uh, most people don't believe. If, I guarantee you if you walked around and asked firefighters in this conference what are the majority of the firefighter deaths and how do you think that relates to on-duty fire ground operations, most would think that it's a medical condition, cardiovascular, or perhaps even cancer that are taking our members. But we still have a lot of operating on the fire ground line of duty deaths and we need to do something to address that. As I said, we have a number of initiatives that are looking at the medical side, the wellness side, the cardiovascular side. We even look at the emergency vehicle safety side. There are a number of programs we've addressed for line of duty deaths, but until recently, nothing dealing with the actual operations and fire ground survival. We will train you and provide you information to do just about everything except save yourself. And we think that's a tragedy and something that we've neglected over the years. And that's why we decided to embark on this important initiative. So what we're going to talk about over the next hour and a half or so is the development of the Fire Ground Survival Program, how it came to be, the components of that program, what all is included in it, what are we going to hand off to you in the end, and then the delivery model. How are we going to hand it to you? What do you get to take away and how are you going to bring this back to your departments? Because we can sit up here and talk about it all day, but it's not going to do any good if we don't give you the how. 
We have a fantastic record of giving you the what. Here's what you should be doing. But how often do you receive the here's how you should do it from us? We think we've covered that with this program. And then because we don't want this to become stale, sit on a shelf and never be used again, we're going to talk about the future of fire ground survival and what we're going to do to improve on the program over the next few years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Derek Alconis. He's going to give you some information on the program itself, and then I'll be available at the end to answer any questions on the actual delivery of the program. Derek? Well, first, I'd like to thank the IFF because uh, without the IFF, there is no programs like this. There is no wellness fitness program. There is no CPAT. There is no peer fitness training program. And there is no fire ground survival program that is embraced by both the IFF, the IFC, where NIOSH, UL, NIST, NFPA, all of those entities were able to participate. They were able to bring everybody to the same place and work on a project that's worthy of our attention. So I really thank Jim and his efforts because he added you know, a tremendous amount of administrative uh, oversight and even expertise to this project. And um, it's still ongoing. This is a living, breathing document, just like many of the other projects that the IFF is currently working on. So um, let's get started. I, well, let me just get a raise of hands of those who have at least heard about the Fireground Survival Program from the IFF. Okay, a lot of you, that's a good sign. How about those who have taken the online awareness course? All right, several, perfect. Anybody gone through an actual, um, participated in a beta test that we had around the country? And several of you still, okay, perfect, excellent. So let's see what it is. So how did we develop this and why? I think that's a question that many people ask. In fact, when you go to your fire department and your fire chief or your city council or whoever um, asks you, well, why do you need the IFF fire ground survival class? And I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to address that question in more depth later on in the presentation. But that will always come up because this is a much more expensive program, we call it the Cadillac, um, than any other program out there. But the reason why is because of the development that was required to create it. And it started with the 2007 AFG Award. And uh, several of us around the country, those of us who were involved with operations and were reading NIOSH reports and looking at the statistics of firefighters dying and looking at the reasons why they die, especially in an operational setting, we started to find some common errors, if you will, or common factors that were, were, were uh, common in different incidents where a firefighter either suffered a near miss or even a fatality. And by looking at those, we thought, wow, is this a cut and paste job? I mean, is this what it is? Is, is, is NIOSH actually cutting from one report on their recommendations and inserting it into another report? two years down the road or even six months down the road where another firefighter dies. And when we get, got off the phone with Nash, they said, and it was Tim Marinar, I don't know if he's here, but Tim says, uh, yeah, that's exactly what we do. Um, w sometimes we do cut and paste because we as firefighters commit the same errors over and over again. And we don't learn from previous experience very well at times. So it was that that kind of prompted us to look even more deeper into this issue of what needs to, what needs, what are the elements that um, are required within a fire ground survival curriculum? So after taking all that to the IFF, um, a committee appointed by General President Schaitberger uh, was directed to develop the curriculum. So this is what that, uh, that com committee, ex consists of, and there's, there's a lot of people, you probably can't read the names, but Austin, Texas is represented, Burbank, California, Chicago, Illinois, LA County, City of New York, Sacramento, Toronto, Tucson, and we actually had several others as well. But that initial group, those people had, those organizations had individuals in the group that 
had some sort of expertise. Either they suffered a near miss, they had developed a program, they had worked with their states, or whatever it may be. And they were committed to the project. And so that was the initial group. Then in 2007, um, at that Redmond in Chicago, um, we asked a question. And that was kind of the initial part of this whole thing, where we had a, a workshop just like this one, and, um, and it was termed Fireground Survival or something like that, or do you want a Fireground Survival program? And really, it was a question posed by the IFF to the membership. Are you interested in developing a, a Fireground Survival program? It was the most well-attended workshop at that Redmond. Now, we asked the question, what would you do in a Mayday situation to increase your chances of survival? That was just one of the many questions that we asked, the participants of that. And uh, the responses we got, got were overwhelmingly odd uh, in that they were all over the map. Um, and we thought, well, isn't there kind of a linear path that we should take? And after we did more investigation, we found out that, yeah, there is a linear path that you can take in just about every Mayday situation. Well, why don't we know those, that linear path? Why haven't we taught that to our firefighters? Um, so we started to work toward identifying what were the most important aspects of fire ground survival. And we looked everywhere. And uh, these are just some of the organizations that we contacted and who provided some expert opinions and, uh, and also some excellent research and, and really good data to support what their beliefs were. And in taking all of this information, we started to piece this thing together. So one of the first things we did was we, we stopped by NIOSH and we asked them to provide us with documentation to support a fire ground survival program. So why do we need it? And this graph is commonly used by Bobby Halton from Fire Engineering. He likes to point to this bubble. In fact, he says, you know, you look at the average number of structure fires in the past 30 years, and it's gone down considerably. And we know the reasons for that. I mean, we have more people out there doing fire prevention, better um, uh, building materials in, in, in some cases, uh, in terms of fire protection, and uh, things like that. So then you look at some other things, also public education, obviously. The other item on this graph that's interesting is the death rate at structure fires. So, and that is provided as deaths per 100,000 structure fires. And so you can see that little bump on top of the blue line. So that tells you that there's, there's something going on, that that red line should actually be at or below the, the blue line. If we continue to decrease in the number of structure fires, we would hopefully decrease the number of deaths of, of firefighters per 100,000 structure fires, but we're not. <clears throat> if you look at this graph, you're looking at rate of traumatic deaths outside structure fires, which is that green line, and it's pretty much followed a declining path. You look at the blue line, that's the rate of traumatic deaths inside structure fires per 100,000 stru structure fires, and that one's kind of gone up and then come down again. And then you have the, the, the red line, which is sudden cardiac death rate at structure fires, which has declined pretty drastically. So we, we have seen some significant improvement in some areas, but in the areas where we get caught inside a structure fire, we haven't seen the improvement that we would like. So this is what this program addresses. But we even went a little bit further and tried to look at, well, where are these deaths occurring? So we can address the specific nature of the traumatic event. So, Non-cardiac fatalities outside of the structure fires dropped and then rose again, we know that. Increase in deaths due to traumatic injuries while operating inside the structures resulted in 62.1% smoke inhalation. So of those people who died, 62% of those inside a structure fire died of smoke inhalation. So something happened. You know, were they lost? Did they run out of air? Um, something like that. Burns, 19%. So these are some of the things that were causing us to kind of scratch our heads and think, all right, so what, what are we doing to, to, to get ourselves in these situations? And then what do we know to do to get ourselves out of this situation? 
And uh, that was the crux of the whole thing, of this whole project. So what else do we learn from NIOSH line of duty death investigations? Well, you need better training on the fire ground survival, on fire ground survival procedures, and they should address these topics. In fact, as we read through several of the NIOSH reports, these bullet items often appear. Proper pre-planning and size up was not part of the, or was not conducted previous to the incident. Therefore, it contributed to the line of duty death. The individual did not know how to call a mayday or was not familiar with their mayday procedures in their fire department or the fire department didn't have mayday procedures. Goes with the second bullet. There was no team continuity. Once they got inside, everybody went their separate directions. In fact, when you look at the training records of some of these fire departments, you find that there was no training to reinforce team continuity when you're inside a structure fire. You start digging a little deeper and you find out there was no self-survival procedures. Radio discipline, many firefighters don't have any radio training. In fact, some firefighters don't have radios, which was appalling to not only the investigators, but also even some of us you know, folks are out on the line every day to find out that we still have firefighters out there without radios, that's just ridiculous. Actions to take while waiting to be rescued. Firefighters didn't know what to do, had no idea. And some of them even said, I would pray um, in some of their responses because they didn't know what to do. So these line of duty death investigations were interesting and looking at them in more detail and stripping off the surface and really getting down into the, in the weeds on these things, you find out that we're just not well trained because there wasn't a curriculum that we can stand by and teach to our firefighters. So the question, are you ready for the mayday? <clears throat> and many people have asked this question of their own firefighters, but I think Sendelbach did a really good job. I mean, he was very proactive and he says, you know, I wanna find out if our firefighters are ready for their worst day. So you may, many of you have probably seen this article that appeared in the Fire Rescue Magazine in July 2006. And it was called, Put It to the Test, Prepare Firefighters for Their Own Worst Day. And this is what he did. Oh, well, his premise is this. If we know what a firefighter's reaction might be in a specific situation due to proper training and standardization, we can react appropriately and with a higher degree of success because predictable actions equals manageable rescue. So we should be able to predict what that firefighter is to do. If we know what they were trained to do, if you had a training curriculum, if you knew what a firefighter was gonna do when they were lost, if you knew what a firefighter was gonna do when they encountered a flashover conditions and they knew how to recognize those conditions, then you on the outside would better be able to predict how you're gonna rescue that individual. Makes sense. So he takes 160 firefighters and he puts them through a simulated mayday experience in a vacant shopping center. And this is what the participants are told. He says, you and your crew are stretching a one and three quarter inch hand line into a structure when you encounter cold smoke and zero visibility. <clears throat> While maintaining voice contact with your crew, you begin searching for the fire. Suddenly, you no longer have voice contact with your crew and become lost and disoriented. This is not a training scenario. Your life depends on your actions. He tried to make it as realistic as he, as he possibly could. And he really tried to ramp things up by making it dark, adding the smoke, and uh, making it uncomfortable like they would in a fire other than having the heat, of course. So then he videotaped them and he recorded all their actions on a spreadsheet to determine, well, he wanted to find out really how well they were trained and how well they could perform in these stressful conditions, even though it was a training exercise. The first thing he found was only 52% attempted radio contact when they were lost. And there was different reasons for that. Only 38% activated their pass device. Of course, we're, we're told when we're you know, rookies and going through um, the academy that you know, the pass device is something you would activate when you're lost or when you're motionless, it will go off automatically. But it's something to alert the rescuers. Well, in this case, every single individual had the opportunity to alert rescuers, but only 38% actually used that pass device. 
And I know many of you are probably saying, well, it gets in the way. You can't communicate on the radio. We know all that. We've experienced it. There's other ways to use it to maximize the, uh, the, the, uh, the audible sound and then shut it off and talk on the radio. Search for an exit, 82%. So that was a pretty high number. Thankfully, they, they felt, uh, you know, most of them felt like they could probably get out, and so they tried to do so. Now look at these other ones, noise with a tool. Now noise with a tool is often what appears in a NIOSH report. If they would have made a noise, we may have heard them. Because oftentimes we have Rick on the outside, or not oftentimes, we should always have Rick or Rick on the outside, prepared to, to rescue us on the inside. But you have to make some noise for them to hear you. So in this case, only 8% made some noise. Signal with a flashlight, only 3% turned that flashlight on which is one of the biggest areas that we need to address because what we found in our travels is that many firefighters don't use their flashlight when they go on a structure fire. And it's even in speaking with a lot of the training officers, even doing our own exercises, it's not a common thing to go on there and, and, and flip your flashlight on. But your flashlight is what may find you uh, by another individual who's trying to search to, to rescue you. Follow a hose line, 9%, many people Get away from the hose line. You're thinking, still, do they really still stray from the hose line? Yes, they still do. And I'm going to show you some other research to tell you why that happens. Because often you talk to people that, were in re that, are, that have experienced a near miss or been in a fatal fire where things just got bad. And oftentimes they say, you know, it happened so fast. It happened so fast because fires develop fast. When there's synthetic materials like we're sitting around in here today, those things have an extremely um, fast fire growth, and you only have seconds to respond to it. So it's one of the reasons why I want to make sure you hold on to that hose line. E-trigger activation, only 4%. Now look at this. Initiated breathing techniques, 1%. Lost portion of their PPE, like a glove, boot, etc. 1%. Lost the radio, less than 1%. Covered pass to listen. Not many people did that. Pass over the hose line. Remove glove, 15%. We've seen a lot of that in our travels too, 15%. <clears throat> and less than 4% exited the building safely. Now that one right there, I have it in red because less than 4% were able to actually extricate themselves without the assistance of a RIC team. That doesn't give you much confidence when you're a member of the Savannah Fire Department back in 2006, obviously. Now you ask yourself, how many people, if you did a simulated Mayday experience in a building fire, much like Tim Sendelbach did, how many people in your fire department would be able to engage all of their self-survival procedures, whatever those may be in your fire department, to get themselves out? And would everybody on the outside know exactly what that person on the inside is doing? Many, many fire departments still don't train with this type of intensity. Okay, lessons learned. Fireground starts with preventing the situation and learning from the past. So I'm actually getting into the curriculum now. So I told you a little bit of background. That is in the curriculum itself because we, we talk about getting ready for the Mayday and what you need to do to better prepare for this Mayday experience. Because the, the course is not only about skills and it's not only about a bunch of lecture, but it's about changing the culture of your fire department and giving you the resources to be able to do that. And one of, the, one of the things that we've done is we've mandated all the committee members, and some of them didn't like it. Yeah, hey, you guys gotta go read some books. You're not just gonna come to these cool cities and hang out. It's gonna be, you gotta read the book, come to the meeting, and be ready to discuss the book. And so we've had several people approach us and say, hey, did you read this? Did you read that? Did you get, the pers did you get this person's account of, uh, of their experience? Um, in a mayday or you know whatever city, so we go out and do some research, and and lo and behold, they, they'll tell us, well, you know what I learned from this is that I actually learned from a book, and I want you to read this book, and so we'd get the book and we'd read it and we share it with our our our, our committee members. So we want to learn from the past, and one of the books that we used was uh, written by Gonzalez Lawrence Gonzalez, and it's called Deep Survival: Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why. And he wanted to find out, you know, what, what is the mindset of a survivor? What does it take? Now, he looks at many different 
types of survival situations. He talks about, you know, people that were snowmobiling. Um, he talks about pilots. He talks about mountain climbers. He talks about downed airplanes and those type of situations. He even talks about firefighters in there. But there's things that come out in the book that are pretty interesting. In fact, we went as far as calling them up. We said, you know what, the book's not enough. We want to hear it from the horse's mouth. Tell us what you really know. I mean, we appreciate your book, and yeah, it was a bestseller and all that business, but we want to know what firefighters should know. And he pointed us to a few of the quotes in the book, and he says, commune with the dead, read the accident report in your chosen field. He said, those who survive are interested in those people who perished before them, who perform the same type of activities that they do. So if you're a pilot, read the experiences of a downed pilot. If you're a mountain climber, read the experiences of a down mountain climber. You get the picture, right? So as firefighters, we do have the opportunity to read stories of our, of our brothers and sisters that have died in the line of duty. And those are from NIOSH. <clears throat> and there's other reports out there, too. Here's another quote that he pointed us to. He said, there are things you can't control, so you better know how you're going to react to them, you better have a plan. You better have a plan for the things you can't control. And you think, well, on the fire ground, there's a lot of things that we can't control. And so we better have a plan when something goes wrong. You better have a plan when it's cold smoke and you can't see and the line goes flat, how are you going to get out? You better have a plan when you see that things are getting bad inside, smoke is starting to bank down, you see some off-gassing of the furnishing, you see some... Um, some rollover over the top of you, what are you going to do? How, how, how much time do you have to find an exit? So these are some of the questions that you have to answer, you have to have a, a plan for. And there are also things you can control and you better be controlling them all the time. Now think of the things that you have control over. Things like batteries in your flashlight, right? Making sure you have air in your bottle, those things. And those things are addressed inside this curriculum but also our eyes. You know, it's interesting, as we, as we traveled around and we did these beta tests um, at six different cities, and we trained over, shoot, probably 40 different firefighters, uh, well, about 300 firefighters from about 30 to 40 different fire departments attended these beta tests. And we really wanted them to, to go through and start marking up the curriculum and tell us where it was bad and tell, tell us where it was good Tell us where we needed to change it, and we go back and change it. And that's exactly what we did six different times. So that's why it took us so long, too. It took us like three years to get this thing done. So, but that's what you need to do to find out really what, what the firefighters need. And what we found in that experience was there's, and as we watch firefighters perform some of these skills that we have here, is they didn't have the skills that we thought they had, meaning like using your eyes. As a firefighter, you need to use your eyes. Well, if you're inside of a room and you have your eyes pinned down on the ground as you're going in because you're on your hands and knees and you're trying to stay low and you never raise your head up, you won't see the rollover. You may not see the off-gassing in the furniture. Those are key indicators you may get a flash over. You can see those things. So, and that's what I have control over is my eyes and where I put, put my eyes on. Okay, training for the mayday. This is another thing that's addressed in here. So mayday, address, uh, mayday drills should include all fire ground personnel like firefighters, apparatus operators, dispatchers, company officers, chief officers. Everybody should be involved. And throughout the program, we show you how to include these other members into your drills. And we even have information written specifically for each one of those ranks to ensure that they get the proper education on how to prevent, how to be ready for, and how to respond to a Mayday event. Because exercising all facets of a Mayday during a drill will help personnel create mental images. Mental images help in the recall of information during an incident. You bet. I mean, that's how we learn. We have to have these mental images. And the more we train, the better we get. And, you know, the first time that we experience a Mayday shouldn't be the real one. It should be the the 10th, 15th, 20th, or 100th time that we've done it. 
So what are the different components of the program? The background. And this answers the question, why, why do we need fire ground survival? And it reviews the NIOSH findings. We go over preventing the Mayday. I shared a few facts with that already. But things chief officers, company officers, and firefighters can do to prevent a Mayday. And then the content includes pre-fire planning, size up, reading smoke, crew continuity, and disengagement criteria. I mean, that's, it's easy to write those titles up there, but creating content to address in a program like this was very challenging. Because reading smoke, for example, that's a whole discipline in itself. Size up is a whole discipline in itself, uh, as well as pre-fire planning. You know, those are, those are their own disciplines that real, really need um, a uh, own dedicated study. However, we, I think we, we, we address those topics in here because they were addressed in a NIOSH or near-miss report as having contributed to a line of duty death or near-miss. And that's why they're there. So as I look through the evaluations of the awareness course, and we have about 6,000 people that have taken it, um, and we've looked at just about every single one of those evaluations. And some say, why is it so long? Do you need all this stuff in there? And I'm thinking, well, believe me, we went through this thing so many times and got rid of stuff and added stuff. And then finally we decided, well, you got to look at the NIOSH report and the near misses to find out what should stay. And these topics in preventing a mayday, we felt were, uh, were required in order to really prevent that mayday experience from happening. All right, being ready for the mayday, that's another chapter. That's actually chapter three. Safety equipment required and firefighter tools necessary for readiness, accountability system, functionality, and dispatch responsibilities. Um, firefighter self-survival procedures. Identification of mayday situations and self-survival standard operating procedures. It's where we introduce the concept of grab lives. It's a mnemonic that you can use to remind you that you should always check your air. That's the G for gauge. You should use your radio to contact somebody when you need assistance. You should activate your pass device. That's the A. <clears throat> so on and so forth. So breathing, staying low, illuminating, using your light, making some noise with the volume, with the V. Finding an escape or an exit and then shielding your airway for the S. Um, firefighter survival skills. Now these are, they're, this is, you know, a lot of people say, well, a fire ground survival class really should incorporate skills and that's about it, but that's not true. I mean, there's, there's a lot of good technical information I think we need to impart to the firefighters to get them to realize that they're in trouble. And that's where those front sections uh, are for. Now, the skills that we have, we have a rapid ladder escape, which we hook, hook to, grab four. We also do a head first ladder escape. There's a window hanged, much like the New York City does. Uh, SCBA familiarization and failure protocol. SCBA disentanglement. Wall breach with SCBA low and reduced profile maneuvers. Self survival procedures with orientation, emergency evacuation. Um, we incorporate the radios quite a bit. I mean, there's a lot of radio usage in these classes. We really want to exercise the, the use of the radio and get the firefighters used to talking on them, especially in these emergency incidents, um, like a mayday. Commanding a mayday is the last one. Um, firefighters' expectations of command. This is chapter five. Commands, responsibility, and manage the mayday. So as far as we know, and as we went to the National Fire Academy, we were there for uh, a few weeks, and we went to the library and we studied everything that they had in regards to Mayday. If it was focused on some kind of Mayday event, um, then we studied it. And we looked at the videos, anything that they had. And it was interesting to find that there was only one article or one paper written, it was an NFA EFOP paper, written on commands responsibilities during a Mayday. And that was it. Um, never does this topic appear in any of the books out there. Um, this is kind of a, I'm not sure why it hasn't received a whole lot of attention, but when you look at the NF, the, the, the NIOSH reports, and you look at some of the near misses, you find that, you know what, command is a lot of the times mentioned as responsible party in some of these events. And so they have to do a better job at, at preparing for these mayday events and know what to do. And so we wrote a chapter on that as well. Now this is where the beta classes um, took place. 
and these are, this lists all the fire departments. Obviously, you can't see it way back there. But, you know, we went to Austin, and we invited several fire departments in that Texas area. Frederick County, Maryland invited several fire departments to participate. L.A. County, New York, Tucson, Prince George's County. Went to all those cities, and, you know, our idea was, hey, look at this stuff. It's an open book. We're going to put you through the entire curriculum and give us some good critique on it. We'll change it as... Uh, as we feel necessary, especially as you, you call out to certain things that just aren't right. <clears throat> so we did this six different times. And um, like I said before, it was very challenging. In fact, I wanted to go to a video. This is the introductory video. You can see the, the quality of it. As firefighters, we are focused on saving lives and property, and often put our own lives at risk. In this video, you'll see what happens when things go bad. And firefighters need to be rescued and how the entire team must work together to improve fire ground survival. What you are looking at are scenes from actual fires. Things happen and you have to be ready. Critical to improving fire ground survival is establishing a standard operating procedure for a May Day. Any situation in which a firefighter's life is in danger and immediate assistance is required, and making sure that everyone follows it. This will include taking steps to prevent Mayday situations before they occur, recognizing Mayday situations early and initiating an effective Mayday call, following a prescribed self-survival procedure and knowing and performing the necessary self-survival skills, and working with Incident Command to aid in your own rescue. By viewing each of the modules in this program, you'll see how these elements combine to improve fire ground survival. While standard operating procedures vary, the objective is always to save firefighter lives. Now that's the introductory video, but we have several videos included within the program. In fact, these are some of them here, and they're, they're divided by chapter. Now, when you decide to, to use this program and you go to the class, um, you get a notebook, and within the notebook, you get some DVDs. And it includes a PowerPoint, all the instructor notes, and videos to, uh, to support each chapter. So. As you see, I'm going to click on one of these. This is preventing the mayday. So there's several videos that you would show to support the lecture portion. It starts with the roof collapse video, reading smoke, vol volume, velocity, density, and color, um, even reading smoke in the interior. And then we use the NIST Iowa fire study at Keokuk um, to uh, kind of look at rapid evacuation when interior conditions deteriorate. So within each one of these, uh, these chapters, we also have some interviews from uh, actual uh, firefighters who either were involved in a fatality fire and survived or were involved in a near miss. And this, this one in chapter two talks about being ready for the mayday. And Axe Dellert from Austin, Texas, He's uh, kind of the epitome of being ready. I mean, he was at the ready when, and he, he talks about this apartment house fire and uh, how he was prepared for a media event of another individual. And he was able to assist that individual um, getting him out of the apartment on the second story because he was paying attention. He had his gear on. So each one of these is, and it, you know, the, the information that we've received back from many of the firefighters out there that have gone through the curriculum 
is that they really like the stories. They like the stories of the firefighters because the stories tell you something about, um, about the incident, a past incident, and it reinforces the concepts that we're trying to teach you within the curriculum. In fact, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you one here in chapter four, since we're in New York. And this is Jeff Cool. He's one of the survivors of Black Sunday. And uh, so we brought the film crew out and we visited that building in the Bronx. It was the first visit that Jeff had since the incident. And I think it was right near the five, fifth year anniversary of it. And uh, he was telling us as we were driving to the, the structure how he was kind of feeling sick, wasn't feeling well, and just feeling different. Um, because that, that was a huge incident, as you remember, uh, where you know, six firefighters from New York City bailed out of the fourth floor, and they actually fell five floors because they, it was, they had a basement that they fell into, a little recessed area. But Jeff was fortunate. He was one of the survivors. And he had never told his story on video before. But he felt like, you know what, it's time. It's time for me to share my experience. I want firefighters to know that they need to train, that they need to be ready, and they need the appropriate equipment to be ready. And so this is his story. Kevin, a whole company just jumped down the rear cage. One, two, three, four, five, six. We jumped in the rear. We need massive EMS here, massive injuries. That's what I've already notified you about. The call came in at about 7.58 a.m. in the morning. We knew it was a four-story building. You know, we started getting the size up as, 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 we, uh, as we came into the, the job, you know, on the radio, additional information is coming in. And uh, we, had it, we were facing a nor'easter that morning. Uh, we had winds blowing in excess of uh, 35 miles an hour, and we had about a foot of snow on the ground. Initially, when we got up to, to the top floor, it was a moderate smoke condition, and it remained that way for the, for the majority of the time. Basically, we're up there searching for life and fire, and, uh, and you know, again, a moderate smoke condition, and there's no fire. We're not finding any fire. Um, they lost water on the floor below, so the secondary line that was stretched to the floor above needed to be back down off the top floor, which is, it, it happens. It happens in fires, and you know, you adapt and overcome in fires, and they backed the, the, the line off the top floor and brought it down to the fire floor to help alleviate the situation down there. We eventually made our way into the, the apartment directly over the fire apartment to help assist 27 truck. Uh, in the kitchen area, I located um, a heat source with the thermal imaging camera. I, I took my halogen, popped a small hole in a wall, and fire immediately started to vent out of the wall. Immediately, my captain uh, radioed for, uh, gave an urgent message and, and uh, you know, asked for a line to be brought to the top floor. We have fire venting out, you know, the, out of this hole and into the kitchen and into the hallway. Four two to division seven. Get it, four two. We have fire into the hallway on the floor above. You need a line upstairs. No water. Conditions are starting to change as, as we talk. And very, very quickly, I step into the hallway. It's dark. And I pan my camera down the hallway, and I pick up silhouettes of a truck company, which is 27 truck. The area that we came in from is behind us, you know, our entrance to the apartment. So I know I got to go get these guys and tell them they need to come back. I walk down the hallway maybe five feet. I have a face-to-face -face with the firefighter that we later know as that's Firefighter Qualley of 27 Truck. And uh, I said, brother, we need, to, uh, we need to fall back. We got fire behind us. We need, you know, need to go to the stairwell and, and wait for a line. He goes, we're trapped. I said, we're not trapped. I turn around and fire floor to ceiling. I should have been, go been able to go through some pocket doors right to a fire escape. But that wasn't the case. Mayday, mayday, mayday! Why did you have a mayday? You're not with You gotta get a hole in the roof before the shield blows down on everybody. Division 7 to the um, mayday message. Good. Who's the mayday? The member from 27 Truck, he's out of here. So, Mask has been lowered to him and there's a member with him. 
But we need to get a hole in the roof. Somebody illegally subdivided this building to make more apartments where it should have been one apartment that we went in. There was multiple illegal apartments and illegal walls that hid these egress areas that should be there for us, you know, and for civilians. Before you know it, we're pushed up and out onto to windows. Hey, Battalion 1-7, all units to the roof. Back out to the stairway, back out to the stairway. It's out the windows on the top floor. 1-7, engine 4-8, how do you make out your line? Runners on the roof, you're gonna need to send the roof over the side. Roof team, send the scoop over the side. To the two, four side of the building. Okay, 6-7 to the division. Four, rescue, hook to rescue, Mayday. Go ahead, boys. Go ahead, Mayday. What's your location? Let's do the rescue hook. Let's do the roof. Get the panel out of here. Hurry up. We need radio silence. I need water in that two and a half inch line. 48 in water to the two and a half inch line. Mayday, get a rope to the roof. Rope to the roof. It came to a point that we had to go, and uh, you know, I mean, thank God I did have a rope. Thank God I had Joey DiBernardo at, at the window to my left to help me. You know, you know, uh, three firefighters to the left of me egressed the building, not in uh, not in any uh, easy way. I mean, they jumped out of the building, and I know that they jumped. I can't see it in my mind anymore. But I, I knew I was the last one in a room. And it happened very quickly. It was one after another. And I, I knew they were gone. And I was sitting there and fires blowing out over my head. And, um, you know, I said to Joey, I mean, we're having a conversation. Not like, you know, we're having a cup of coffee or anything, but we're having a quick conversation. I go, Joe, I have a rope, but I have nowhere to tie it off to. And Joe, you know, uh, Joey said, throw it to me. I go, no, no, no. I said, you go. And I'll. somehow I was going to lower him. I don't know how I was going to do it, but I was going to get him out first. And uh, he says, throw it to me, you have a wife and kids, and, uh, and I'll get you down first. So I threw him one end of the rope, and he wrapped it around his arm, and then he stood on the rope. And I took the, the other end of the rope, and I, you know, what I had left, and I wrapped it around my body in what we call a body belay, and I grabbed onto the rope with both my hands, and I, and I rolled out the window. I, I fell literally a, an inch from the top of the step, falling another 10 feet where the rest of the firefighters fell. Where firefighter uh, Qualley and Stolowski and Myron and Ballou and firefighter Di Bernardo ended up falling. So I fell 10 feet less somehow. And you know, I mean, I was, in, I was in a world of hurt. I mean, I broke everything in my body. Everything that you can think I broke, I broke. Four New York City firefighters did survive a remarkable leap of faith on January 23rd but two fire lieutenants did not. Eugene Stolowski, Joseph DiBernardo, and Jeffrey Cool have been on a roller coaster of medical ups and downs since the fire, fighting life-threatening infections and respiratory collapse. DiBernardo says he wouldn't mind fighting fires again, but Cool doesn't think it's in the cards for him. The ordeal has taught him to let go of anger in his life. All I want to do is one step at a time and get up and walk with my kids and enjoy life. Somebody, you know, I mean, the firefighters that were back there and EMS, they did an exceptional job, you know, taking care of us, you know, and, uh, and they saved four of our lives. And, you know, unfortunately, we lost two of our brothers that day. Every day that we come to work, whether it be the chief of the department to the youngest probie, we need to train and hone our skills and stuff that we already know and learn new skills to help alleviate situations that you might find yourself in like I did that day. Again, you know, the, the training for success, you know, um, we do need to train for things when they go wrong because they do go wrong at fires and uh, we need to be smart and uh, cognizant of the fact that these things can and will happen. And, we are interior firefighters. We fight the fire from the inside. We go in to save life and property. And we need to, to have the best equipment available. And we need to learn from mistakes. When you find yourself in a situation, we need to control ourselves as best as we can and find something deep within us to say, hey, you know what? Tommy over there is calling a mayday. Jeff over here has to slow down and, and allow this mayday to take, 
you know, to get acknowledged and try to see where it is. And I trained every which way to go out a window. And ultimately, where did I end up? I ended up on the ground, you know, some, some 40 foot below, busted up in a fight for my life. So if it can happen to me, it can happen to any firefighter, you know, I mean, anywhere in, in the country. And, and, and we need to, to be better at our jobs. The man that I once was, you know, our lives have changed. And I mean, I, I, I live with this every day, the pain. I'm in a doctor's office three days a week dealing in physically and mentally with where I am. My life has changed, you know. I mean, I, I'm, I, I would give anything, get one more time, get up on the rig. So you can see, I mean, the, 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 qualities, the quality of the videos <clears throat> and uh, the, the attempt that we make to get the message across that you, you, you need to take this stuff seriously, um, you know, bear no expense. And uh, people like Jeff, and there was, there's others too, Jeff Helvin's another one um, who's able to speak and acts, like I said, and we have others lined up uh, that will be contributing their story on video that'll be part of the program. So this is a, an ongoing process. Now, I wanted to continue with, you know, how we're delivering the program and address some of these more specifically. The awareness program, this is a screenshot of it, and this is accessible to anybody who has an internet connection. You don't have to be an IFF member. It's open to anybody. Um, you can, if you log on with your IFF number, even better. If you do not have an IFF number, you can still go through the program. And um, this is one of the screens that you would see. It's kind of a four-pane shot. So you'll have an instructor providing lecture and a slide, pre, uh, a slide on the right-hand side there. And there's the slide. Now, on the lower right-hand corner, you'll see a chat room. And those who want to participate in a chat, they want to, if they're on the same section and they're viewing the same videos, then you can enter this chat room and speak with other people that are watching the same thing that you are. And it allows for some discussion to go on. Now, at LA County, we tried it out. We actually had two different stations watching at the same time. And they were able to, you know, participate in this back and forth discussion. Um, some have used it really well. Some don't care for it. But it's kind of neat. You know, when you're in the queue, you can get in there. You find out who they are. It doesn't say where they work. Um, but at least you can have this discussion, this live chat with people that are watching the same thing that you are. Um, the other thing on the left-hand side, the lower left, you have two pieces there. Uh, the first piece is uh, the top one, which is the video navigator. That tells you where you're at in the, in the program. And then it also has active links. So if I choose that blue link there, that'll actually take me to that specific study. So that one happens to be the UL Structural Stability Program. So if I click it, boom, it shows up. I can read the study. And we always, we felt like going through this, um, this whole project, we felt like, we needed to have more access to all these studies that have been created. All these scientists out there doing good work. How do you find this stuff? Well, we found it by chance. You know, you Google it, you look through countless lists, you click on one, it's not good, you check the other one, not good, and then you finally find one that's worthy of something that you can use, and so you read it, and you may send it out to your friends, and that's it. But we felt like 
you know what, it's the IFF's responsibility, it's the IFC's responsibility really to take ownership of this stuff that's out there, the good stuff, and make sure we get it in the hands of our firefighters. And so this is the venue with which we're sharing that information. It's all there as you go through it. There's the active link. And you can also post a question. This is pretty slick. So if during the video I see something that kind of interesting to me or I don't have an answer for, then I can pinpoint it on the video and actually write a question. You know, what is happening here, he writes. <clears throat> and that question gets emailed to members of the committee. We can answer the question. So it comes over our phones. We see it. All right, got it. I can answer it real time. Makes it pretty slick. So it allows for uh, more active learning so the, the student can participate um, in a discussion on a, in an online fashion. It also has a test. And this is a, a screenshot of the test, or the, the beginning of the test. So each section that you go through will require you to take this test. And the test questions are, uh, they're, they're repopulated after every time you log on. So if you're in one section, you don't finish, and you come back, it'll, it'll, it'll keep you on that same segment but the remainder questions that you have left will, will change and uh, it just keeps them, keeps them fresh, the test questions. So we've written several test questions to support every learning objective within each section. And that also was looked at by industrial psychologists so we make sure that it's consistent with what, how test questions should be written. Now some have complained that, man, these test questions are ridiculous, which you know, we're constantly looking at the test questions to make sure they're right. Um, so we appreciate your, your, your input when you, when you do send us something like that because we're always looking at the test questions to make sure that they're reading correctly. But this thing has four and a half hours of streaming video, links to approximately three and a half hours of supporting reports and documents. And um, we've had about 6,000 people. And on my phone yesterday, I probably had about 60 new evaluations from those who have completed the program. Um, so we get roughly 40 to 60 today of, new, of, of folks that have completed the program online. So right now we're sitting about 4,000 that have completed it. But this, it works real slick if you're looking for something you can, you can use right away for your recruits, for example. Right? And, uh, where you tell them that, hey, before we have fire ground survival training, we want you to complete the awareness program for the IFF fire ground survival program. And uh, you have them do it on their own time. We did uh, at LA County. Uh, we couldn't fit it into our, our schedule, but we gave them a couple weeks to go ahead and complete that. And then they, at the end, they actually print out a certificate and they bring it to you. And what that allows you to do is to address some of the topics that they covered within the program in a more uh, conversational way because now they have a background of the information. All right, so delivery of this thing. Um, operations course and train the trainer course. Let's look at these. Um, first, let's look at the instructors. You have a master instructor, which is, we pro I think we have about 15 now, 15 master instructors, and they will teach the train the trainer courses. Then you have IFF certified FGS instructors. Those are the folks that have gone through a four-day train the trainer class, and they are now FGS instructors, certified. They get a certificate. Um, and for this program, if you want to use it, it requires you to have a license, which means you have to send two people to the train the trainer program. It's required that you send two, not one. Um, the, the reason for that is because it's, as those of you who have been involved with fire ground survival training in the past, um, it's a labor intensive type of training. You need people that know something about the curriculum. You can't just send them out there and say, okay, we're going to do some upper floor egress work, so go ahead and strap on a, uh, a belay system and we'll go ahead and fly out of the window. It's not that easy. There's a certain way you need to tie them off. You have to use certain ropes. And everything within this program addresses certain standards within F NFPA. So 
it's, uh, we, we've taken as much safety precaution as we possibly could in developing the program. Last one is FGS assistant instructor. And these, these folks can assist the IFF certified FGS instructor with teaching operations course to members of their, of their fire department. So these, these members have not gone through the train the trainer, but they have gone through a, like a three-day course offered by you as an instructor within your own fire department. And then they could be deemed FGS ins assistant instructors. They can help you out. Now, the purpose of the license um, ensures the IFF FGS is delivered only as intended. We don't want people taking it and bastardizing it and do whatever they want or not following the safety precautions in there. And all those, um, you know, several of the, of the drills are very dangerous. And if you don't follow the lesson plan and you're outside of this book because you, you got it from somebody else and you're on your own. Um, so the IFF really wants to protect this. We do as instructors as well. And once you become an instructor, you'll see why. It's because it's, it's important that, you know, that we uh, maintain the integrity of it and we don't allow people just to copy pieces of it and take what they want of it. You've got to use the whole thing. Protects integrity of the program and interests of the IFF members. Users must use the program in whole and only for the purpose of survival training. We know safety shouldn't be compromised. Now, the full license. License granted to IFF-affiliated fire departments when at least two members of the department are IFF certified instructors. And the FGS certified instructors teach members of their fire department, and they may teach members of other fire departments if it's an official consortium. So if you have a training consortium of five different fire departments, then, and you're one of the, or you're you're one of the two certified instructors for that consortium, you can go ahead and train the members of those five fire departments. Limited license. These are non-IFF affiliated fire departments. Third party training organizations that want to use the program to train members of, let's say they belong to a, um, a state training organization or something like that, where they want to adopt the program. It's allowed. You would get a limited license if the state of California, for example, would want to adopt this program as their official program. Pay limited license fee annually. Now, the IFF is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the number is on that yet. Uh, maybe when Jim comes back, we can ask him. IFF to conduct on-site reviews and audits of facilities and programs. They want to make sure that those who are using a limited license that they are performing all the safety precautions necessary when performing these skills. And so there will be an occasional on-site review and audit uh, to make sure that they're doing it correctly, much like the CPET, no different. The copyright, so you can't just take this and give it to your buddy and say, okay, and just think of that. I mean, if, if we did that with all the things that, we, that the IFF created, we couldn't create anything more. I mean, you, you, you have to, this thing has to be funded in some way. Yes, we used a grant to develop it, but there is going to be a fee um, for those who want to uh, attend an IFF train the trainer session. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Two options for the operations course. One is direct delivery. So the course, the, the course would be hosted by a fire department. And, but they would be taught by the IFF master instructors. So we fly in and we do the whole thing. We bring the props and we use your equipment and we train all of your people. Everybody gets trained. Now, if you have a small fire department, this may work great. Now, the advantage of it doing that way is that you have now a, a diverse um, a group of instructors to train your personnel. And uh, we would, and we've done this before, if we go into your city and do this, and you have certain procedures that you want to review, certain mayday procedures or radio communications or whatever it may be, then we would go ahead and review those items as we got to those areas within the curriculum. So that's not uncommon. Now, the other one is indirect delivery, which is course hosted by the fire departments for its own members. And it's taught by fire departments, IFF, certified FGS instructors. So it's your two members going out. They get certified. They come back. They host the class. That's perfectly okay and within the confines of the license. You got the facilitator notebook and you get CDs. That's what you get for the program. 
um, in addition to a lot of training, obviously. But within this manual, it's 300 and something pages, you have, it's a five chapter book, and that's about 100 and something pages. And then you also have all the PowerPoint slides and instructor notes, and you have all the skill lesson plans. And it gives you a step-by-step -step picture on how to perform the skills. You also have um, evaluation sheets for each of the students that go through it. So now that you have a, your firefighters go through a certain skill and you want to evaluate their performance, you have something to document with. And you use that and you can file it. And that gives you evidence that that individual was taught that specific skill. And the DVDs and the videos. Um, this is just a cutaway of what uh, the, the manual looks like. This is the chapter portion. So the five chapter book is included and it's exactly, you can actually download this on the IFF website when you go on the awareness program. And just like we support uh, the lectures with the video with certain stories, we have those same stories written into the program. All right, train the FGS assistant instructor course. Now, like I said before, the assistant instructors are those members of your fire department who do not attend to train the trainer. You as an, an FGS instructor who went to a train the trainer can go back and host this class. And uh, in that way, you can get people uh, within your own fire department that can assist you in delivering the program to the rest of your fire department. So what are the delivery options? One is consecutive days. Units taken out of service for eight hour days to complete FGS training requirements. Some have done it that way. Some do it on a shift schedule where they remain in the districts. Training takes place in smaller blocks and um, where you spend two to three hours on a certain FGS topic and you move on the next day and you hit a few more topics and so on and so forth. In fact, at LA County Fire, we trained 3,000 firefighters within the, using the entire curriculum. And we did it over the course of 10 shit. Well, there was 10 drills you had to give. And the drills lasted anywhere from two and a half to three hours. And we incorporated all the lectures and all the skills. And we also reviewed all of our um, self-survival procedure policy that we have within LA County and uh, reviewed some other things as well while we're going through the curriculum. So it, it really was a, a great way to, to address some of those most important policies that you have on the books you never get a chance to to really get down in the weeds with but this is uh, this curriculum off you, offers you that opportunity so what's in it for the future for FGS um, additional online modules we're working on those right now additional skills based on real real life incidents additional online quizzes um, webcasts accreditation all of these things I mean we're working there have been several community colleges that have contacted the IFF interested in adopting the curriculum. Um, so they would work under a limited license, which, you know, we're interested in pursuing that. I think that would work well. They can use the curriculum to train their entry-level firefighters or even firefighters that are going back for a refresher in this topic. So some of the other things that we're looking at is, I mean, a lot of you have probably seen this, this the newest underwriters laboratory um, technical uh, study. It was the impact of ventilation of fire behavior and legacy in contemporary residential construction. And it was just printed near the first of the year. And um, this is interesting because some of the things that we've known to do as firefighters in the course of my 20 plus years with the fire department, uh, you know, the, the way we ventilate, the way we attack fires, all of that is in question by this report. I don't know how many of you read this, but we started looking at this and really dissecting it and finding where we need to address some of the things that we discuss in Fire Ground Survival, namely reading smoke, uh, namely how we enter a building, how we exit a building, how fast it takes us to realize that the conditions are getting bad and that we have to get out. Um, this study addresses some of those issues. In fact, the study that, that was previous to that one is a study that I got this graph from. And this is, this is uh, 
This, this was interesting because this is taking the technical information from, from UL and trying to make it usable for the firefighter. What do all these graphs mean? Why do I need to know it? Is it really that important? Just give me the fire hose. I just want to do the skills. Let me roll around on the pavement and do my thing, man. That's all I need to know. But it's, it's, it's not that simple. Firefighting is much more technical than we give it credit for. In fact, this graph is interesting because it was taken from that UL study where they took, a, they took um, simulated homes or uh, rooms and they put synthetic furnishings in it, just like you would buy at Ikea, it's the stuff that we have in our own homes. And they lit fires and then they watched them. They had thermal couples in different parts of the room. Not only in the room where the fire was burning, but also in adjacent rooms and even hallways. And they wanted to find out how fast this stuff goes to flash over. Because I don't know if you guys do it, but I get these alerts on fire engineering and firehouse and all that, and you find out who got caught in a flash over. And they come out pretty frequent. In fact, just look at our own fire department. We had several, you know, helmets charred, BAs malfunctioned because it got all burned up. So people are, our firefighters are getting caught in these flash over conditions fairly frequently. And we need to address that. Well, this graph kind of, it, um, it points to the reason why we get in, caught in these flashovers. And in this one, it was, the fire started in a bedroom, let's say. I, I'm sorry, in a living room. And they let it go. And flashover usually occurs about 1,100 degrees. Now, you can see that sharp upswing of the curve, that red line. Um, well, I'm sorry, it's the blue line, which is the temperature of the ceiling in that room. Obscuration is what you can see, okay? So when you're 100% obscure, you can't see a thing. It's totally dark. So at flashover, which is about 1,100 degrees, um, it happened on this fire about seven, seven and a half minutes. So seven and a half minutes, you're thinking, wow. If you backtrack on when we get the call, how long it takes us to get there, and all of that, you have to ask yourself, when do the firefighters arrive? Because we want to know how f what it takes to recognize when you're in trouble, and then how long it takes you to perform an action to save yourself. Because you can practice all these wazoo different techniques, but if you don't have the time to perform the skill, you get burned up, right? OK, so in this particular graph, we find out, OK, if you, end, if you, if you get there at that time, then you have plenty of time to put out the fire there, there, there. As you get closer to that upswing and it gets really hot, you don't have as much time to put water on the fire. And you have to identify when the fire is starting to go to flashover. So the off-gassing, rapidly uh, a deteriorating neutral zone, you know, all these things. You get rollover. If you start to see those things and you have to make a, you have to, you have to do something to get yourself out. But how, what's the time necessary? Well, I asked Dad Madrakowski this from NIST, and I said, what does it take? In the uh, NIST report from Keokuk, you guys said it's about 60 seconds to recognize you're going to flash over. And he says, no, nope, that's old. We used to think it was 60 seconds. You know what it is now? 10 seconds. You have 10 seconds to perform an action to save your life before this thing flashes. And we know we're encapsulated. We can't feel much of anything, especially when you're way down low. So, the only way to save your life is when, when that thing starts to swing up, you have roughly 10 seconds to see some kind of change where it would tell you, you got to get out of there. So you got to exit the room. You got to get out of a, of a window. But you know, can you do that in 10 seconds? Can you get through a wall in 10 seconds? No. So you're going to have to back it up a little bit. <clears throat> you actually need more time. So all of these things are, are leading us to more study of these topics and, and making sure that this curriculum addresses these data points. And another thing we're looking at is the current LODDs that are coming out. This one is from Illinois. You guys probably saw this. This is where we lost a firefighter. I mean, you look at the smoke coming out of that thing. You know, now that this, this will be incorporated into the next phase of the curriculum or a, or a CE portion of it. Well, we're looking at smoke and I, trying to identify w when it becomes deadly and when you have to perform the action to save your life. So we're getting into checklist and uh, looking at what should the firefighters be thinking about. 
um, when en route, when at scene, when inside to save themselves. And, you know, what is the common ground between each one of these categories? We even went as far as even reading a book on checklists, even studying more about it. I mean, it just goes for on and on and on. Uh, you, once, you, once you look at, okay, I guess firefighter needs a checklist, they're going to have to remember something. Well, how do you remember it? Then you read the studies on it. So, <clears throat> anyway, why IFF, FGS, and not the others? That's the big question. Because you're going to go back home and you're going to say, okay, we're back to where we started. Hey, city council, fire chief, we want to use the IFF Fire Ground Survival Program. Fork out the dough. We're ready to go. And they're going to say, well, why? Well, the reason why is because no other program has gone through the amount of research that this one has. None. We looked at the state programs around the country. None of those programs included these entities of NIS, NIOSH, UL, and incorporated all those studies into their curriculum. And none of those other programs address safety issues and uh, concerned with um, you know, upper floor egress and, and ensuring that you're abiding by the NFPA standards of, you know, for ropes and people who are tending ropes and all of those things. So it's because of these things that this is the most comprehensive program out there. And uh, you know, it's ready for all of us to use. And it stays contemporary. You know, it's new. It'll stay fresh. We have people uh, that are, are going to continue to contribute to it. And obviously, it's endorsed. Questions? I know I spoke for a long time, but uh, let's get some questions out here. If you have some questions about it, I can answer. Um, Maybe that'll help you in, in, uh, in getting it within your own fire department. You mentioned that you were going to talk about the training trainer program, boss time frame. Okay. All right. Yes. Train the trainer program is four days. They will be offered around the country. Hosts, well, fire departments can elect to be a host. There will be 25 students, well, I should say 25 to 30 students. We'll go to a max of 30 students in each class. Um, so if you want to host the class, you will, be, you will receive a set of the props, the props you see out here, one set of those, and the total cost of the class is $45,000. What does that amount to per person? It amounts to about $1,500 per student. Now you're thinking, wow, that's a lot of money. Now, um, we looked at the cost of other programs. We did all that. Um, in terms of the amount of resources that, uh, that were spent so far on this program, it's still not going to recover all those costs. And, uh, but we feel like it's, uh, it's, it's appropriate in this case. Another hand? Come on, you guys got to have some questions out there. Um, oh, yeah, let's talk about the grants. Yeah, where do I get the $45,000 from? That's a good question. Um, AFG, that's our, our friendly grant source there. I think that would be the best bet. In fact, uh, those of you who've written previous grants, you'll know that AFG kind of lends itself to a, a labor management um, consortium of different fire departments participating in this event. In this case, it would be Fireground Survival. And, uh, and that's what they want the grant to include, is different fire departments to show this interoperability thing and to address interoperability issues. In fact, the IFF has grant language. We've already had fire departments obtain grants for the program, and uh, so it's out there. And, yeah, be aggressive with that. Yes, sir. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. 
Well, you, you're seeing metal props out there. Before this, we had wooden props. And uh, the wooden props were a lot cheaper than the metal props. Um, those metal props, I, do we have a, a final number on that? I don't want to share an incorrect number. Um, so let, let, her, let Courtney dig that out. Now, now are the, you know, the, the th we like the metal props. We've used both. We've, we've gone through different gyrations of these props to make sure that they were safe and, um, and they were usable after a certain length of time. The wooden props just don't last. Obviously, most of us live in areas where they get weathered, and so you're rebuilding these things over, you know. And uh, so even though you can build a set of wooden props for about a thousand bucks, that doesn't count the labor, um, but these things are considerably more. And I want to say they're pushing, delivered and everything, I, I want to say they're pushing, come on, Courtney, help me out, 11,000. Yeah. Now, that's all included in the grant language that we're going to provide you, too. Um, you call the IFF, they'll shoot you out a, a complete grant package, and all those numbers are there. Now, I know the numbers seem a little daunting at first, uh, but those fire departments that we visited and uh, shown the wares to, if you will, they said this is so different than what we had before, and it includes so much more. And you can tell, I mean, what, you know, those videos that we've produced uh, take a lot of resources when you're going on site and, and shooting all that stuff and designing props and making sure everything is safe. <clears throat> Not yet. So fire departments who want to be a host site need to sign up. Um, we've had several fire departments call the IFF office expressing interest. And uh, they were told to call back after the Redmond, basically, <laughs> because this kind of took precedence. But we anticipate there's going to be quite a bit of activity with that. Um, we've had a couple community colleges in California that are interested um, in getting the program online, and uh, several fire departments expressing interest to, to host a class, a regional. And some, even, some fire, smaller fire departments have, have considered doing a direct delivery while we just send the guys. Uh, or our instructor cadre there, and they do the whole thing. Yes, sir. Uh, cost for the th uh, three-day direct delivery. Do we have that? Thirty-five. Uh, Thirty students. And that's that includes the cost of the props. Anything else? Yeah. That includes the cost of the licensing. That, that includes, you get for that, now when you host a class, it's kind of like a PFT class if you've hosted one of those. Um, you host the class, it gets posted on the IFF website. People start signing up, okay? So once the class fills up, we got a max of 30 in there, and those that have sent their money in, then we commit the props to that host site location. Now, remember, the fire department doesn't have to come up with the $45,000 in you know, one lump sum. Um, it's, the IFF will collect the $1,500 per student until the class is filled, and then everything gets shipped out. And then the host site gets the props. Oh, we're doing it differently on this one? OK. So actually, I, I, I misspoke. So now it looks like we're, the fire department has to commit from 30 firefighters to attend the class and have one purchase order instead of several um, to process the funds. That's true. Yeah, we, we have problems with the PFT with that. All right, any other questions? Five locals per license. Yeah, so let's say you hosted a class of 30 and you had uh, 15 different fire departments represented because you need two from each fire department. Um, then they would get, each get a license. You have 15 different licenses be issued on. Yes. 
Yes, they would automatically get a license. Once they complete the class, those two members complete the class, that fire department gets license. That's right. Um, license is unlimited right now. I mean, like with the CPAT. Um, they will be an occasional audit that will be sent out to ensure that you're still using the program correctly, but uh, it's unlimited. If you fill it out correctly, send it back, you're good to go. And right now, they're starting to do actual on-site visits with the CPAT, with the limited license holders. Um, but those who have a full license, which are fire departments, then you would just have to complete a, a form and yeah, we're not even doing it annually for the CPAT, so I'm not sure how often that would occur. Now, let me ask you guys this. I mean, do you see any challenges with this? I, I, I want to make sure that we, we clear any kind of roadblocks up um, that you may have with your own fire department. What kind of resistance do you anticipate? Yeah, it's, it's issued to the department. The department takes responsibility for ensuring this is not the local's responsibility to, to train the firefighters, unless it is on your fire department, but it's the fire department's responsibility. So it's incumbent upon them to follow the rules. And this is the beauty of this, is that the, uh, the IFF, in their wisdom to address Fire ground deaths have developed this program for each one of our fire departments. And so now we don't have to develop our own. We just have to adopt the program. Now, there's a cost associated to it, of course. It, it shouldn't come out of our, our union dues, correct? Not everything should. It should come out of our fire department budget. Um, we developed the program, meaning all of us as local members of the IFF, um, and now we are saying, here it is, we've done it, let's spend the money to train our people. And uh, so I, I know some of you maybe um, have questions about the fees associated with it, but <clears throat> it's an attempt to re recover some of the funds that were spent up to this point and to continue the program going forward. And something like this, you know, when we first started out, we wondered, why hasn't anybody developed a fire ground survival program nationally? Why hasn't IFSTA done it? It doesn't make sense to me. But after we rolled up our sleeves and started getting into it, it totally made sense. <laughs> because it's so hard to address. Some of these topics are very sensitive to firefighters. Um, and it's very challenging to write it in such a way where it doesn't offend somebody. Because one of our members died on, because of one of these issues, or one of our members was seriously injured, or I experienced a close call, or whatever it is. And so, you know, we're trying to be sensitive to those, to those issues, but at the same time getting the information out there. And we felt that. Every time we, we did one of these um, beta classes around the country, we definitely felt the pulse of the membership out there. Anybody else? All right, if you, uh, you know, if you want to come and look at the notebook, it's up here. Um, please stay tuned on the IFF website and uh, look for some classes to be posted. We look forward to having your, your department host a class. Thank you very much. Have a good time. <laughs>